Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates. Hi everyone, I'm Brian Page, in for TRB, and I'm a historian of science and technology. Thanks for attending this presentation on the 1921 amateur transatlantic test and the shortwave revolution that followed. Let's get started. Lots of good stories begin with a failure, and the transatlantic test was no exception. Surprisingly, the whole idea of an amateur transatlantic test did not originate with the ARRL, the American Radio Relay League. It was the brainchild of Milton Blake Sleeper, the editor of the radio department of the magazine Everyday Engineering. However, before the magazine could pull it off, they had to suspend publication. Sleeper, therefore, approached the ARRL to take over the test. On the nights of February 1, 3, and 5, 1921, select U.S. stations transmitted prearranged texts for reception by British amateurs. While the U.S. amateurs have been relegated to the useless wavelengths 200 meters and down, the British amateurs had been allocated what was then considered prime frequency real estate in the 1,000 meter band. Thus, British amateurs had little experience with short waves, and their antennas and receivers were not optimized for the 200 meter signals used by U.S. hands. Additionally, British amateurs were plagued by harmonics from their commercial stations, plus their own QRN originating from poorly adjusted regenerative receivers. The result of the test, failure, abject total failure. Of the 250 stations listening for the Americans, not a single one unequivocally copied a transmission from any of the two dozen US hams authorized for the test. As the QST writer observed in reporting the failure, quote, we would bet our new spring hat that if a good US amateur with such a standard American regenerative set and an Armstrong super could be sent to England, reception of US amateurs would straightway become commonplace. So that's exactly what the AWR did. But before we look at that, exactly why were the longer wavelengths so favored? Without knowledge of the existence of the ionosphere, physicists were challenged to explain the success of Marconi's 1901 famous reception on Signal Hill, St. John's, Newfoundland, of the S signal from Poldhu in Southwest England. Although there had been early scientific speculation by Kinley and Heaviside about the existence of a charged layer high in the Earth's atmosphere, the theory of surface diffraction prevailed. In a nutshell, it was known that light and acoustic waves would bend around a spherical surface. Snell's law, which is primarily used in optics for the design of lenses, shows that waves bend toward a region of higher index of refraction. And the surface of the Earth has an index of refraction, which is quite high, as does the atmosphere, with a decreasing index of refraction with altitude due to the stratification of the air and the water vapor in the lower atmosphere near ground level. The first guy to take a crack at mathematically explaining the phenomena was Hector Monroe MacDonald of Cambridge University. He modeled the Earth as a sphere composed of a perfect conductor. In this simple model, he showed that radio waves do bend around the surface of the Earth. And the longer the wavelength, the more strength they are able to retain as they bend. But his model was extremely simple. Next up was the Frenchman Henri Poincaré, who refined the model. It was better in that it showed that radio waves could go completely to the opposite side of the Earth. However, his formula included a constant that could only be determined empirically, the, the rate, the actual rate of attenuation. And he didn't have that value. But the matter wasn't completely settled. So, Another Cambridge physicist 
John William Nicholson took a swing at the ball. His paper on the bending of electric waves round large sphere appeared in the Philosophical Magazine in 1910. Nicholson's results are fascinating and a lesson in the way that science works. He incorporated empirical data to prove conclusively how and in what amount radio waves would refract around a sphere such as the Earth. This was good hard science. And it also showed that, as everyone expected, the longer the wavelength of the signal, the greater the signal strength at the receiving end. However, and here's the interesting part. Nicholson observed that his predicted signal strength didn't match experience, writing, diffraction must be a relatively insignificant agency in the success of experiments such as those of Marconi. Thus, diffraction could not significantly be responsible for long distance propagation. When it comes to diffraction, his mathematical solution was airtight. What he proved was that diffraction wasn't responsible for long distance propagation. Therefore, something else must be going on. So we have a mystery. So who are you going to call? How about the United States Navy? The Navy had a bunch of stations scattered around the globe with antennas that looked like this from Key West, Florida. For command and control, the Navy needed hard data on propagation. That task fell to Naval Radio Telegraphic Laboratory at the Bureau of Standards and um, Austin, Lewis W. Austin. And his, um, his work cast a long shadow. Austin arranged for the station at Brant Rock, Massachusetts to conduct sending tests on 80 kilohertz and 300 kilohertz with two Navy battle cruisers, Birmingham and Salem in late 1909 and early 1910. To make a long story short, Austin developed an entirely empirical formula taking into account the transmitted wavelength, the distance between the transmitter and the receiver, the heights of the transmitting and receiving antennas, and the current in the transmitting antenna. antenna. The result was a fairly accurate, tidy little formula that reasonably matched actual practice and applied to the long waves used by the Navy with their several hundred kilowatt rotary spark transmitters. The Austin Cohen formula told the Navy what they needed to know. And the fact that it described long wave propagation only implied that long wave lengths were superior. That brings us back to the ARRL transatlantic tests and sending one of our own to the UK. The US amateur chosen for this, shall we say, D expedition was Paul F. Godley, 2Z Echo, one of the premier receiver designers in America, famous for his Paragon RA10 regenerative receiver. Godley and his receiver were so famous that he acquired the nickname Paragon Paul, a name which stuck to him forevermore. When you take a look at the receivers, you can get an idea of why British amateurs may have lacked the skills to handle the 200 meter signals. Here's one seen in the boneyard at Dayton in 2007. That $950 price is comparable to the cost of one in the 1920s. Let's peek at the insides. This is just the tuning unit of the RA10. And you can see why a faint signal may, or tuning a faint signal may have been a delicate affair with those nested coils that all rotate inside one another. The second attempt was planned for 10 nights in December of 1921. Recall the first test was in February, beginning on December 7th, not yet a date that would live in infamy. Thus equipped with a Paragon RA-10 
and an Armstrong superheterodyne receiver, Godly boarded Aquitaina in New York Harbor bound for Southampton. At that point, fortune smiled on the endeavor. Before even leaving the dock, Godly met Harold H. Beveridge, RCA engineer and newly famous for inventing the Beveridge antenna. Godly and Beveridge hit it off. And as Godly reported, quote, during the voyage across, what time was not spent sleeping found me either talking to Beveridge or in the radio room. Upon arrival in England, Godley was met by H.J. Tattersall, superintendent of the Marconi Company in Southampton, who shepherded Godley through customs with all of his equipment intact. Marconi, Mr. Marconi, and the company that bears his name should need no introduction. Marconi at that time was the world leader in wireless communications with its powerful long wave stations knitting together the far flung corners of the British Empire. Marconi had a history of confounding expert opinion, and he took great personal interest in these amateur shortwave tests. And the Marconi company was not alone. RCA had loaned some of its latest and greatest vacuum tubes for use with both Godley's receiving equipment as well as one of the transmitters back in the States. More on that later. Once clear of customs, Godley was whisked off to London where he attended a lecture by John Ambrose Fleming, inventor of the vacuum tube. And he met other dignitaries, including Marconi himself. Though Godley reports receiving well wishes at every turn, he noted, quote, I am quite certain there wasn't an amateur in all of Britain who thought it could be done. Their skepticism was well founded. The British hosts had arranged for Godley to set up his gear in the home of Frank Phillips, a radio engineer and noted amateur. Phillips's home was near London. And when Godley tuned up his receivers for the 200 meter band, he discovered, in his words, and what do you suppose we found? Static, gobs and gobs of it, and harmonics, whole orchestras of them. Home was never like this. One could read nearly all the high power stations in Europe on or near 200 meters. Godley endured five nights of this, and then he called up Plan B, like James Bond, and headed for Scotland. Specifically, Godley selected the little village of Ardrossan, a few miles outside of the town of Glasgow. Here, the Marconi st Company stepped in to help save the day, providing transportation, antenna wire, insulators, batteries, and much else. Godley arrived in Glasgow on the evening of December 3rd and quickly got to work, gathering supplies and moving all to Ardrossan. There, he and his helpers erected a 12 by 18 foot tent, all in a howling storm. Then on the 7th, the day, was the te the, the day the test was to begin and taking advantage of his shipboard encounter with Beveridge, Godley laid out a classic beverage antenna, 1,300 feet stretched out pointing towards Chicago, supported by 10 two by four posts, 12 feet off the ground. The beverage is a wonderfully directive and efficient receiving antenna. The directivity largely eliminates interference and static coming from any direction other than where it is pointed. The noise suppression function was really important in these early days of radio when filtering was practically non-existent. In one case, Godley tracked 39 harmonics from one commercial station and also from poorly adjusted regenerative receivers, which were themselves miniature low-powered transmitters. 
So what's inside the tent? He did bring an Adams Morgan RA-10 regen. And as you would expect, a Armstrong super heterodyne receiver. Looking under the covers, we can see five stages of RF amplification, two detectors, and an audio amp. The uh, schematic is equally interesting with a rheostat on the heating element of each tube, which I'm kind of at a loss for, but obviously there were lots of adjustments, as well as an external heterodyne circuit for uh, picking up the uh, uh, CW signals or for uh, demodulating the CW signals. Also in that cold, windy, rainy tent was D.E. Pearson, the chief inspector of the Marconi Company in Glasgow. He was there to serve as a check operator. So finally, at 1 a.m. on December 8th, all was ready and Godley began searching for amateur shortwave signals. Then, in his words, exactly 33 minutes later, the universe cracked wide open. In one magic moment, Scotland's erstwhile gloomy shores became a haven of rest. Muscle soreness, soul soreness, fatigue and doubt vanished. And my unexpected difficult but insistent duty became a joy forever. Godley had caught a station signing one AAW, running a synchronous spark transmitter rag chewing with an unheard station. The storm still howled and eventually the signal disappeared. That's when Godley discovered that his antenna was down. One pole was broken and the others were out of line and scattered. In any event, at 6 a.m., Godley and Pearson pulled the plugs after 21 hours of work and headed to the hotel for a bit of rest. Testing continued for the next few nights. On the 10th, they heard station 1BCG for the first time. 1BCG was specifically provisioned for the test and will be described in detail later. Conditions rocked on the nights of the 10th, 11th, and 12th, with dozens of stations heard and 26 logged. The vast majority of the stations were using CW, that is, vacuum tube oscillators. As you undoubtedly know, CW packs all the power into a very narrow bandwidth. Still, a few spark stations were received, and even with their inefficient and bandwidth hogging signals, they were logged. Station 1BCG was the powerhouse signal and Godley noted, the most remarkable feature was the strength of some of these signals. 1BCG's signals could have been easily heard 400 feet from the tent. Godley and Pearson considered confirming this speculation, but they were deterred by the Scottish weather. Signal strength likely made a huge impression on Pearson of the Marconi Company, especially once he found out that two of the CW stations were running less than 30 watts. Godley comments that Pearson was convinced that one BCG was running several thousand watts. Recall that successful reception involved copying pre-arranged pre five-letter code groups, such as L-X-C-A-M. Godley did that, as Pearson confirmed, but the crowning achievement was copying the first standard traffic message to cross the Atlantic Ocean. Hearty congratulations, Berghart, Inman, Grinnan, Armstrong, Amy, Cronkite. It turns out that Godley and Pearson weren't the only amateurs in Europe receiving the US signals. One BCG had been heard by five British hams, a Dutch amateur in Amsterdam, and by an American radio man on board a ship in the harbor at Hamburg, Germany. If nothing else, 
The transatlantic test definitively showed the superiority of CW over Spark. Godley tallied the Spark and CW stations logged, and he noted, quote, and glancing over the above list, one is struck by the preponderance of the CW stations and by the fact that the British heard CW stations only. This can mean only one thing, that CW is far superior. And I should like nothing better than to see all amateurs change over to continuous wave at once. Spark methods are horribly out of date and are so inefficient comparatively as to be ridiculous were it not that many have invested good money in Spark equipment. So the transatlantic test was successful and Godley returned to the States a hero, his well-deserved reputation further burnished by this feat. But let's turn now to the other side of the ocean, to the station and the transmitter at 1 BCG. Recall that first formal message that was signed by six individuals, Berghard, Inman, Grinnan, Armstrong, Amy, and Cronkite. The call 1 BCG belonged to Minton Cronkite. The Armstrong in that list was Edwin Howard Armstrong, inventor of the regenerative receiver, the super heterodyne receiver, and FM radio. These guys were heavy hitters. Much of the coverage at the time centered on Paragon Paul in his Scotland adventure, but now I'm equally fascinated by the hastily constructed station 1BCG located in Greenwich, Connecticut. The transmitter is a snapshot of 1921 state of the art. It was of a type known as a MOPA, Master Oscillator Power Amplifier, using four RCA UV204 radiotrons which had been loaned by RCA for the test. We'll see why in a few moments. The one on the right is the Antique Wireless Association 1996 replica, replica for the 75th anniversary of the event. And that replica is now being restored for the 100th anniversary. This photo of the restoration now in progress gives you a really good idea of the size of the one BCG transmitter and those beautiful tubes. One tube served as the oscillator, and the other three were wired in parallel as the power amplifier. Power for the rig came from a 2,200 volt, 1.5 kilowatt generator with AC drive. Interestingly, the oscillator ran continuously. That's at position A on the diagram. Transmission was performed by two magnetically controlled keys. Um, essentially a single pole double throw. So they're circled on the schematic. And those fed the oscillator output to the power amplifier and simultaneously opened the grid leak circuit. Altogether, the plate input power was about 990 watts, far, far from the several kilowatts suspected by Pearson in Scotland, putting out about six amps into the antenna for effectively 558 watts output power. It's no wonder that one BCG punched through so well to Paragon Paul in that little tent in Scotland. Looking at the schematic, you'll also notice there's no crystal. Frequency control, if you can see my pointer, frequency control was um, a crystal control, was not yet an established technology. The oscillator frequency was determined by the parallel LC circuit and, get this, also by the resonant frequency of the antenna. This is also why a station's frequency could vary in windy conditions, which brings us to the antenna. Setup of the whole station was first begun on November 21st and completed on the 30th, just a week before the test was to begin. 
I'm certainly envious of the station layout. The Radio Shack is directly beneath the antenna. And what an antenna. And describing the station, George Burkhard, one of the principals, noted that the natural resonant frequency of the antenna was 195 meters, close enough to their 230 meter signal that monitoring showed the frequency did not vary in the wind. They exercised this great care knowing that an Armstrong super heterodyne would be on the other end. And in Berghard's words, quote, a pure undamped wave must be used. It is obvious that the super heterodyne with its great selectivity and highly resonant system cannot give its maximum response when there is any discontinuity or variation in amplitude of the transmitted wave. They recognized that a stable CW signal was needed to stay in the selectivity passband of Godley's receiver. The other aspect of their station that I love is the counterpose. At least 19 elevated radial, radials, each 60 feet in length, extended from the top of the radio shack. In his official report, Godley says, I took note, too, of the veiled interest which had been shown in engineering circles. Later, after the signals began to go into log, he noted, some radio history was being written in that miserable tent. We've seen that both the Marconi Company and RCA bent over backwards to give the test every possibility of success. For RCA, a success would, no doubt, promote the sale of their tubes to the 20,000 American amateurs. Considering that the UV204 tube used in the one BCG MOPA sold for $110 in 1921 money, a little publicity certainly wouldn't hurt. But much more was at stake for RCA than selling tubes to hams. In the same time frame as the transatlantic test, RCA was in the process of building a grand scale transmission facility at Rocky Point, Long Island, known as Radio Central. The plan was to install 12 massive low frequency antenna complexes, each consisting of six 400 foot steel towers with 150 foot cross beams supporting 12 parallel wires, 7,500 feet in length. The operating frequency was 18.2 kilohertz and the CW signal was generated by Alexanderson alternators. An alternator is just a motor generator that outputs a pure AC sine waves. 18.2 kilohertz is in the 16,500 meter band. But on the plus side, the Alexanderson puts out 200,000 watts. To say that this sort of operation was expensive would be an understatement. RCA inaugurated Radio Central on November 5th, 1921, just a month before the amateur transatlantic test. <laughs> you can see where I'm going with this. When President Warren G. Harding pressed the button set up in the White House, sending out the first message from Radio Central on that day, only two of the alternators and antennas had been built. Those two were the only two that were ever installed. In the years following Godley's success with shortwaves, RCA adopted shortwave, installing some 80 tube transmitters with power ratings up to only 40 kilowatts at Radio Central. Harold Beveridge, the RCA engineer, who designed the receiving system for Radio Central, described the shift as the shortwave revolution. 
Marconi similarly adopted shortwave, indeed preceding RCA's deployment. Marconi progressively tested shorter and shorter wavelengths, finally settling on 32 meters in October 1924, where he achieved successful 24 hour a day global capability. Another organization to take note was, as you might guess, the United States Navy. The Navy was in much the same situation as RCA and Marconi, running huge rotary spark exciters into giant antenna complexes. The cover of QST even takes a little jab at NAA, the premier Navy installation in Alexandria, Virginia, just across the river from Washington, DC, where you have Uncle Sam saying, by gosh, I'll trade in AA for it. So let's conclude with Beveridge's words. So the shortwave revolution, as you might call it, really changed the whole picture of international communications. The 1921 transatlantic test had implications far beyond amateur circles. And that revolution began with Paragon Paul Godley in a little 12 by 18 tent pitched in a freezing gale on the coast of Scotland. And here's Paragon Paul describing his adventure on the cover of Wireless Age. Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates.